Hi, I'm back. Um, yeah, so uh, this talk is, is going to be very different from the previous one I did. This is about some, uh, some work we did in, in storage uh, and, uh, and, and some of the lessons that we learned uh, along the way. Um, so a brief outline of the talk, I'm going to talk about uh, some you know, tough uh, trade-offs related to the CAP theorem and, and similar kind of theoretical bounds on uh, distributed systems. I'm going to talk about availability and, uh, and what we call blast radius and how that informs a lot of uh, the design work that we've been doing in AWS. Um, and then I'm going to talk through the architecture of the system we built called Physalia uh, to uh, meet a particular need in, in a particular piece of our AWS architecture. Uh, so let me start with a super simplified uh, block storage system. And so, you know, a real cloud block storage system has, uh, you know, is going to have a volume spread over lots of machines. It's going to have multiple clients and so on. But let's simplify that way down to there is one client driving I.O., a primary copy and a replica of the data. And they're doing a kind of chain replication style protocol. Uh, great for moving data around, but, but not equivalent to consensus. Uh, and so reconfigurations need some help. And so if a failure happens, like a network partition forms in the network, uh, and for those who don't know, network partition simply means that the network is up on both sides, but you can't talk across this, uh, this red line. So uh, a network partition forms in our network, uh, and we want to continue to be able to do I.O. And so uh, because our replication protocol is, uh, uh, is, is not, uh, you know, not a full-on consensus protocol, at this point we cannot continue um, safely, and we need to uh, ask for some help from a higher power. Um, and so the primary will say, hey, I used to be the primary. I got all the data. I'm up to date. My cache is warm. I still want to be the primary. Uh, and the replica is going to say, well, I didn't hear from that primary, so uh, I want to take over. Uh, and they're going to go to this higher power, and the higher power is going to tell them, you know, you can do it or you can do it, and it has to do that uh, consistently. Um, and, uh, and specifically, the property that we need here is linearizability. Uh, and a linearizable uh, compare and swap type operation, compare and set type operation, um, to be able to do this safely and to, to play this role in the protocol. Um, but, you know, if you're a distributed systems person, I think you will have already noticed the problem here. Uh, you know, we can't really have this consistency and have all of the availability that we want. So let's talk through some of the, uh, some of the challenges there. Uh, what if this partition forms? So the primary can get to the higher power, and the higher power needs to have a single place in the network because it is consistent and therefore can't be available on both sides of the partition, uh, and the replica can get to the client. You know, what, what do I do? Um, well, I have no choice but to become unavailable. And uh, you know, becoming unavailable is a pretty bad thing when you're uh, uh, you know, a fundamental piece of, uh, of, of cloud architecture. So this is one kind of degenerate case. The other much more common one uh, is that a partition forms or a failure happens, which takes out this, uh, this configuration service, this higher power, and makes it unavailable uh, to uh, potentially both sides or, or one side. And so that's also bad. And uh, you, know, you will have noticed that the system can continue to do I.O. As, you know, without talking to this higher power. But as soon as a failure happens, as soon as there's a connection dropped or something else, it needs to be able to go and ask for this help. Um, and then you know, you've seen a lot of kind of brag diagrams in, uh, in this session. Uh, this is not my brag diagram. But it is just a ball of hair to say, in the real world, this stuff doesn't happen really nice and neatly. Um, in, uh, in you know, three boxes or four boxes, uh, it happens in a really complex network in a big data center, often hundreds of thousands of servers, tens of megawatts, and so on. So it's a, you know, these are big installations. Um, and the decision that you're fundamentally forced into making and cannot avoid making because of the way the theory works, so those theory people spoiling our fun again, uh, is you have to put the locus of consensus, you have to put a majority of that consensus either on the top of that network partition that's just formed through our database or on the bottom. You just can't have both. Um, and so that's a problem. If we want to be super highly available, uh, how do we do that? Well, the way that we do that is by reducing the radius, by drawing as small as possible circle that we can and putting everything inside that circle. So we want to put the clients inside the circle. We want to put the primary. We want to put the replica 
and we want to put the configuration service inside the circle uh, because that lets us avoid uh, this partition line, right? Because we're on the right side of it every time. As long as we're small enough, it becomes super unlikely that that line will cut through us no matter how it slices up our data center. Uh, you know, this is the, uh, again, a track about, uh, about deployment experience. Um, and I've just kind of been lying to you so far. Uh, network partitions don't really exist. Uh, networks don't tend to fail in this nice way that A is working and B is working and there's a perfectly clean cut. Instead, what really happens in networks is just chaos ensues for some period of time. Uh, and when things settle down, some things can talk to each other, uh, sometimes on different protocols, sometimes on different ports. It's all mad. Uh, and there are enough really uh, you know, you know, network war stories in this room uh, that I'm sure, uh, you know, if you're interested in some crazy ones, uh, you can find somebody to explain all of that uh, or to tell some, some, some stories. Um, so this is kind of setting the scene for why we care about this stuff. Uh, so uh, so let's, uh, let's kind of uh, talk about a different concern, and that is what we call uh, blast radius and how it relates to availability. So if we go to a super high level and think about the architectures that people build on cloud, they build architectures on cloud that use this tool called redundancy to get availability, right? I make two copies of something. I use RAID. I use a primary and a backup. I have a failover architecture. All of these things fundamentally use these ideas of redundancy to get more availability than any single component in the underlying architecture. This is like architecture 101. Um, but there's always an asterisk, and always the asterisk is availability improves redundancy as long as the failures are not correlated. And so if you have a RAID, 10 hard drives in a box, and that box catches fire, all of that redundancy has done nothing to help you. If you have all of your copies on you know, the same network and the whole network breaks, all of that redundancy has done nothing to help you. And so there's a really important lesson about availability here. The lesson about availability is, you know, when we think about availability, and I know, uh, you know, there's a very abstracted model, we want outages to be infrequent, right? We want high uh, time to failure. Um, we want high time between failure, and this is good stuff. We want outages or events uh, to be short, to live for a very short time. So this is low time to repair. And this is something that, as a cloud provider, we invest very, very deeply in and continuously. We also want outages to be small. Because what small means is uncorrelated. We want the, any uh, event, any problem that happens in our system to affect as few resources as possible. Because when it affects few resources, customers can build uh, architectures on top of the cloud that use this redundancy tool to get better availability than any single component and get rid of that asterisk in their availability calculus. And so that's super important. Um, and not something that is typically talked about. So over the years that we've run AWS, we've uh, thought more and more about the small. And we have an internal uh, internal you know, talking uh, idea called blast radius. How can we bring down the radius, the number of customers, the number of resources, the number of things touched by any failure in the system? And uh, this has brought us to you know, a very big change in architecture. Because when, you know, when cloud architecture really started, it was all about building the biggest, most bulletproof thing you can and spreading it as big as you can because that's how you get the economics and it's fantastic. And it turns out that building these big bulletproof things is fun, but they're not really bulletproof. And so you have to have a little bit of humility and say, well, when those failures happen, how small can we make them? How can we build this blast radius concept into our architectural decisions? Um, so this is also abstract. Let's, let's talk about Physalia. Uh, so this jellyfish here, this is Physalia physalis. It's the Portuguese man of war. Um, and it's not actually one thing. It's, uh, it's an organism made up of uh, a whole lot of kind of individual organisms, all of which are uh, well adapted to a particular role in pretending to be one floaty jellyfish. Um, and if you're like me and you kind of grew up in summers, as soon as there's an onshore breeze, you couldn't swim in the sea, uh, you'll be uh, familiar with these horrible things. Um, 
But this was our, uh, our inspiration, this idea that you could build an organism out of lots and lots of small pieces. So let's go back to radius. We take our client, our primary, and our replica, and we put them as close together as we can. And as close to that as we can, we build a small consensus system, right? A small, uh, a small group of nodes. Here I've pictured five. Our production uh, version actually has seven um, that, uh, that can provide this kind of uh, higher power, this, this configuration store uh, that will allow us to recover the replication protocol uh, when things break. And we want to put those uh, nearby. And so we call each one of these uh, small consensus groups a Physalia cell. Uh, a Physalia cell is a single replicated state machine. Um, it contains the configuration for one volume or, or one small group of, uh, of, of storage volumes. And their configuration is the, uh, is the replication data I talked about, but also partition maps and various other things. There's some, you know, just generally the metadata that clients need to be able, and servers need to be able to participate in this highly efficient, simplified replication protocol as a full consistent po po participant. Uh, the thing we built uh, uh, has a key value store API, um, but that offers uh, strict serializable transactions uh, within each one of these groups. And uh, that's actually a bit of a stronger API than you really need. Uh, but one of, the, uh, one of our other lessons here of building this kind of system is that we wanted to build a strong, uh, very, uh, you know, API with, with, with the strongest semantics we could offer locally because it makes it easier for programmers who are using this stuff to use it in the most obvious possible way and avoids the bugs uh, that often come with more subtle uh, API guarantees. And so we take this stuff and we try through uh, numerical optimization, both at creation time and continuously in the background, to minimize the radius, uh, to, to squeeze these things down. But it's actually not only about minimizing, right? If I wanted to only minimize the radius, I would put them all on the same machine and be done. But I don't want to do that because that's going to cost me a lot of availability and a lot of durability and so on. So there's actually a really interesting trade-off here. Uh, and this is... Uh, uh, you know, when I, increase, when I decrease the radius, I can lower partition risk. So the smaller the circle is, the less likely it is to be cut by a network partition. I get lower availability blast radius, right? Uh, because any network partition is going to cut fewer of these things. But if I make the circle bigger, I get more of my own internal redundancy across power, across network, across rack positions, and all of this other stuff. And that's good for availability. I get more bisection bandwidth, and bisection bandwidth is super important in the kind of calculation, uh, and that just means like how much bandwidth I have to move between groups of servers, um, and this is super important in the calculation of the durability of any replicated storage system, uh, because it uh, controls how quickly I can re-replicate. Um, and I get more placement options, so I get more options, more places that I can put stuff uh, to have it uh, kind of be optimally placed. And so this is a really interesting set of trade-offs, and this is one of the, the most interesting things that we do with Physalia is we take um, the topology of our network from the teams that run our network, we take the topology of our power from the teams that build our data centers, we combine those two with a numerical optimizer, and we come out with what we think are optimal solutions to this tough trade-off that optimize for availability and blast radius. Um, so it's, uh, it's not only uh, strongly consistent. Uh, there are some places in the system where we looked and we said we definitely don't need strong consistency. For example, when clients need to discover which uh, Physalia cell to talk to about a particular volume, they do that by going to an eventually consistent discovery cache. Uh, when we do monitoring, we do that with an eventually consistent kind of monitoring pipeline model. Uh, when we repair Physalia cells, as nodes in them might fail, we do that with, uh, with a kind of meta control plane that uses eventually consistent data. Uh, and we did a bunch of kind of formal methods work uh, to, um, to prove that that eventual consistency didn't break the correctness of our various protocols. Um, but the lesson here, I guess, is that eventual consistency is actually easy and cheap to build, uh, but can be subtle. Uh, so take advantage of it when you can. Um, 
And so this idea of optimizing for blast radius goes beyond just the architecture. So we talked about cap trade-offs, but there's a whole lot else going on here that we talk about in the paper. Um, overload, for example. If you have one big system, it li is likely to all become overloaded at the same time, and so that's a large, bl large blast radius. So partitioning things up reduces that kind of blast radius. Uh, software bugs. We've heard a lot about deployment practices today. Fantastic work. And, uh, you know, as hard as we try on testing and deployment, software bugs really happen. So if we can roll them out in a way that we can very clearly reason about the maximum number of volumes they touch, we can have lower blast radius for, you know, whatever bugs remain in our software after all of the testing we've done. And then operational issues. And operational issues continue to be a big driver of cloud events something we keep investing in, something the whole industry is investing in. Um, but again, by set, designing our operational techniques, uh, we can reduce the blast radius of any you know, bad tool or, or, or bad technique or, or, or whatever might happen. And this, for me, is about building the humility that we've learned into the systems that we build. You know, we can be these really kind of arrogant architects and say we're going to build this bulletproof system that will never break. Uh, but the reality is, is that's actually just not achievable. And instead, if we build humility into our systems, we can think about when things break, how do they break, and how, do, how can we make them break in potentially the smallest possible way. Um, and so just a little bit of data. Uh, so I couldn't do a whole talk without a graph in it. Uh, so this graph shows the error rate observed by servers going to the configuration service. It's a very internal kind of metric. Uh, before and after the green line is the, the, the Physalia deployment. Um, and you can see that these error rates are super spiky, and generally the super spikiness is driven by the fact that when partitions happen, when large-scale failures happen, the traffic to this configuration service is in itself super, super spiky. Uh, and so, uh, so these are mostly overload-driven. Physalia scale-out nature helps avoid that. Um, yeah, thank you all. Thanks, Mark. Questions for, for Mark? We're running a little bit over time. Mike Setkoff, uh, Limelight Networks, uh, great talk. I just wanted to ask you if you had any replication across the cells themselves, like if one cell fails, does that mean that the piece of data that was hosted by it becomes unavailable or there is a replica somewhere else? Yeah, in, in, the, uh, in the unlikely event that a cell fails, and it's, you know, it's got seven copies, uh, and so we have a lot of time to repair, but in the unlikely event that a cell fails, that volume is lost because we can no longer reason about um, the uh, correctness and consistency of, of the data there, and we have some ways to expose that. Um, but with the sort of background cell repair and seven, you know, seven copies, cell durability is higher than the design durability of the block storage system. And so uh, that is a very rare failure mode. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, um, I'm Z from Microsoft. Uh, so if I have a very big fail, I need to use like hundreds of cells. How do you manage the consistency between the data in the cells and uh, rather let the problem to be the original problem? Um, how do we manage the consistency of the data in the cells? Uh, the cells are the authority of the data that they contain, and so any uh, copying of the data, any replication of the data elsewhere in the system always flows outward from the cells. And so anti-entropy mechanisms can go and look at them as the, uh, as the authoritative copy of each fact. I'm not sure if that answered the, the question you're asking. Oh, yeah. Maybe we can talk offline. Okay, I'll, sounds I'll, good. Uh, Chinmay from Nutanix. Um, in the paper, you mentioned that when you migrate uh, nodes uh, or replicas from a cell to multiple nodes, it's very fast because the data sizes are low. Uh, what is the estimate of the sizes that these cells usually have for it to be fast and slow? Uh, I don't have an exact number I can share, but less than a megabyte. Uh, so, so relatively, you know, that. On, on a modern data center scale, minuscule. OK, last question. Uh, you mentioned that you use some kind of numerical optimization for calculating these blast radius and so on and so forth. Like, what is the scale at which you run this optimization? And like, do you make partitions? or like, And what is the granularity at which these decisions are made? 
Uh, yeah, so we ran across an, uh, a, a data center, um, and so that's about probably 30-ish megawatt facility is the scale that you can think about that at, and that's the, the, the radius over which we do all this optimization, and then we try and kind of comb the hair until it's, uh, you know, each, each individual thing is as unconnected as it as, as is optimal. Um, and so uh, there, there are, are a lot of pieces in that. We have to do it online, and that's a really interesting problem in itself, which we don't talk about in the paper uh, for, uh, and we aren't, uh, aren't ready to talk about. So uh, it's a really interesting problem, but I don't have anything to share on that, unfortunately. Okay, on to break. Thank you, Mark, hey, again. Thank you very much.